What a privilege to once again be able to share with you from the Word of God. This book was used by the Holy Spirit to change my life. Um, what can I say? The Word of God. And I hope that you will make a commitment to spend more time in the Word of God. We're going to look at two verses in the book of Galatians. We wish we could look at the whole chapter, but two verses. And I think the first one is Galatians 2.20. For me, one of the most important verses in the whole of the Bible. And to be honest, I feel the message of Galatians 2.20, the message of the cross, the message of the crucified life, is not emphasized so much in these days. Galatians 2 and verse uh, 20. I have two different uh, translations in front of me. One is the NIV and the other is a, parave, a paraphrase, uh, the message. And the, the verse is powerful in either one. We'll start at verse 19 in the NIV. Though through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Very powerful. I want to ask you, are you experiencing the reality of of the crucified life in your daily walk. I think of the words of Jesus. If any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up the cross and follow me. That's repeated several times in the New Testament. So why is it not sinking in to the average person? So many people that I find are in trouble in their Christian life when I get to talk to them, they're living by feelings. They like to go, for example, and sometimes have praise and worship for, for an hour and they, and they love it and they feel good. And I'm not against that. But I will tell you, if that kind of praise and worship doesn't lead to radical discipleship and commitment and serving others and loving others, then somehow it's becoming like entertainment. We need to find the balance. To do that, we need more time in the Word of God. And we need to understand the teachings of our Lord Jesus and passages like Galatians 2.20. So many people who are writing to me and I get thousands of letters and emails, they're having difficulty in the sexual area. And when I get to investigate, I find they don't know what it is to really live a disciplined life. No matter how filled you are with the Spirit, no matter how blessed you are, when you get up the next morning, you have to live a disciplined life. Paul said, wow, this is, I'm sure, one of your favorite verses. I buffet my body, bring it into subjection, lest after preaching to others, I become a castaway. One of the most distressing things in my pilgrimage of many decades is to see fallen Christian leaders, men and women. And I believe it's unnecessary. People are trying now to justify it. And if our message on grace and forgiveness, I believe in all that. Restoration, hallelujah, is not brought into balance with the message of the cross, the message of the disciplined life. Passages like, oh, another favorite verse, endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus. He has not promised us an easy time. It's going to be rough. It's going to be tough. There are going to be disappointments. There are going to be times when we certainly don't feel like witnessing. There are times in my life when I don't feel like preaching. I preach about 300 times a year, and sometimes I head for Heathrow Airport for another tour, kitch, kissing, uh, kicking and screaming. I bring my wife with me for a little bit of psychological help until I go through immigration, and sometimes I break down and cry. I just feel so distraught. How can I keep on going? But the Word of God says, not I, but Christ liveth within me. I quickly deal with the self-life. I quickly deal with my own selfishness. And let the vision flow to reach more people with the word of God and to preach the gospel. 
If we're going to be long distance marathon runners, not just one more short term Christian sprinter, we must understand what Jesus did on the cross for us and that this includes now us denying self, taking up the cross and following him. The second verse is in Galatians that brings all of this into beautiful balance. And it's Galatians 5.22. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. That's one of my greatest struggles. Whoa. You know, if any of you have total, absolute victory over all patience, I'd really like to meet you someday. Really, I'd like to get your autograph here in the back of my Bible. I've got a section here that says hypocrite, sign here. Because most people do struggle. It's that little book, Calvary Road, that dealt a blow to me, that irritability, which I was also struggling with, moodiness, irritability, that it's a sin. We need to deal with it. Wow, that was a powerful message. As a young Christian, in my first couple of years, just before I went to Mexico, I was 19 when I went to Mexico, and this ministry began. There's, by the way, a book about that, and maybe I'll mention that at some other time. This verse, Galatians, was probably the most powerful verse in the Bible. And I prayed, Lord, I want that fruit in my life. I was shortly to get married. You know, I thought I was getting pretty spiritual, quite sanctified. Moody Bible Institute, winning people to Jesus, going to Mexico, prayer nights. I thought I was really becoming stronger in God. And then I got married. You know, marriage has a way of really exposing hidden, subtle areas of the self-life. And I was not a very good husband in those first months and years. But when I sinned against my wife, with my tongue, with my attitude, with some extremism, God would hit me. One of the very first conferences in the Mexican border in the whole history of OM, in an amazing way, every night I spoke on a different fruit of the Holy Spirit. I don't think we got that recorded. That led us to publishing a book called Revolution of Love that we'd be happy to send to you as a gift. Many people have said to me they felt the book Revolution of Love represented the heart of the OM DNA and my own personal DNA more than any of my other books. And I've been rereading it lately and sometimes it brings me to repentance. I want to ask you, will you take an inventory? How are you doing in terms of the fruit of the Spirit? What about love? Why are we always excusing ourselves for lack of love? Cannot we believe God for a greater transformation in our lives so there's more love toward people and even toward those that don't like us or people that maybe have hurt us? The revolution of love is an ongoing process. For me, it's a challenge almost, almost every day. And then about peace, of course, that's a lot easier because peace is something more that God gives to us. Whereas love, we've got to exercise it toward God and toward one another. But it's all made possible through the Holy Spirit. But we make a huge mistake if we think once we've got some experience with the Holy Spirit or we're more spiritual, these things will come automatically. We've got to go back to other scriptures. Yield your members unto righteousness, the Bible says. And I'm convinced a lot of people are blaming God for things in their own walk when God has done his part. The ball is in our court now. The Holy Spirit lives in us. This fruit is available if we'll deal with self, if we'll repent, if we'll grow more mature in the Word of God, if we'll be more vulnerable and develop accountability. I believe one of the reasons God's enabled me to run the race these many years is I always shared some of my struggles with at least one other person. And then when I came to Britain, that's 46 years ago, I immediately got aboard an accountability group that I could share with. I fear for people that have very little accountability. They're living their Christian life in a private little closet, especially unwilling to talk to anybody about some of their failures and sins. Well, praise God for his peace. And I've known that peace. As far as I know, the memory can fail me. I've known that peace every day. That's why one of my favorite books is Billy Graham's book, Peace with God. Are you experiencing that peace? Kindness, goodness, faithfulness. If we're going to evangelize the world, 
We can't do it with just short-term summer sprinters. I believe in those things. We need long-term people. We need people who are faithful. When they make a commitment to the Muslim world, which is one of my biggest passions, they're going to stick to that. And maybe they're living in Turkey now. Maybe they're living in some tough place like Afghanistan. The discouragements come in. The feeling, I'm, you know, I'm finished here. I want to go home. They will be faithful to the calling God has given them. Now, he may lead them to only be there five or ten years. And we don't want to misinterpret what faithfulness can mean. It needs balance like all other great challenges. And then gentleness. I remember when I was struggling with this thing of worry. A book came into my life like a tornado out of heaven. How to Win Over Worry and Care by John Aggie. I was actually just on the phone with him, a very elderly man still running the race, recovering from the loss of his son, many sadnesses. And I got that book. And he had, I'm not big on slogans, but he had a slogan in there. Prayer plus poise plus praise equals perfect peace. You'll be surprised what God convicted me the most when I read that sentence. The lack of poise in my own life. I was sometimes nervous and a bit fidgety and biting my nails. And I'd go into a room where there were people maybe uh, gathered having uh, something to drink before the meal and I'd feel uneasy. And I probably looked uneasy. And God broke me and showed me that gentleness and poise and humility, it, these things all tie together. As I've observed many Christian leaders around the world and read their lives, and many of them are great examples, but I feel that as Christian leaders, all of us need more humility. If we have more humility, we'll be more big-hearted in loving and accepting other ministries that are very different from ours, other churches, that, that sing different songs and behave in different ways. I guess I've spoke about 20,000 times over the years in thousands and thousands of churches, and I've come to love all God's people. I don't agree with everything. I'm frightened of extremism, but I believe, let, let all the flowers bloom. Let's attack the weeds, but let all the flowers bloom. God is working in different ways in different people. The fruit of the Spirit is worked out in different people in different ways and not through the annihilation of their temperament. So God never made me into sort of a quiet type of person. I remember I admired uh, some of the quiet speakers at Keswick when I first spoke there, but God convicted me. I could not copy these quiet speakers. I read these books by a, a great man of God, Gordon, Quiet Talks on Prayer quiet talks on, this, on the Christian life. And I felt convicted. I was too loud, too noisy, especially in Britain. And I started praying, Lord, help me to be quiet. Lord, help me to be quiet. It was a wonderful day when the Lord said it was okay to occasionally shout. My British friend, Alan Redpath, when he was ministering in Chicago, he used to shout. It, it can be difficult. I was speaking at the Round Church once in Cambridge, and I got a little too loud, and a lady gave me a note at the end of the meeting. Thank you for coming to our church, but there was no need to shout. We Anglicans are not deaf. Of course, some of the Anglicans I've met are deaf, but I'm trying to be more balanced in my preaching. I want to ask you, are you manifesting the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Would you memorize this passage? Would you ask God to do a deeper work in your life that you may become more Christ-like and you will accomplish much more in his kingdom if you'll walk this road. God bless you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word, sharper than a two-edged sword. We thank you for these two great Mount Everest verses here in the book of Galatians and pray that it may be absorbed into our spiritual DNA that we may never be the same again. And whenever we fail in any of these areas, whenever the fruit is not being manifest, may we be quick to repent or if necessary, even apologize and grow in humility and wisdom and grace. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.